let's talk about drill speeds. Um, what I recommend in your motor, and this isn't what you have to do, I'm, I am one opinion, uh, and, but well, inside of this drill right here, I do program it a specific way. Um, my first setting is going to be very high speed. I do mine at 2000 um, and 30 newton centimeters for my torque. And then over here in the water, I am turning my water up pretty high. Any higher than that, it's just kind of like a flood <laughs> on this handpiece. So it's a little bit in the middle. Um, and drilling high speed, right? It is freaking, it's very, very high, right? And when we're drilling, it's gonna be extremely, uh, right, a lot of water. So high speed, lots of water, pumping action on terms of the, the drill when you're going in and out of the osteotomy to keep things nice and cooled and hydrated. Uh, that is by Carl Misch. So Carl Misch recommends this type of setting when you're drilling, right? High speed, lots of water. The next one is you're gonna see 50 RPMs in 50 Newton centimeters. And my water is still on at that point. Uh, this is called biological drilling. Biological drilling, you actually don't have to have any water on. So usually on this setting, I'll just drop it down to the lowest one. And let me put this one back in the memory because this is one of the uh, motors we use for all of our courses. So now it's back to where I like it. So I use 50 Newton centimeters, 50 RPMs, very low water or no water. I like to keep just a touch of water on there. Technically with biological drilling, the whole purpose is uh, keeping any cells and blood inside the osteotomy along with the bone that's left intact. That way you're not disrupting or moving all of the cells and bone outside of the, of the osteotomy. You're keeping biology, bi biology inside the osteotomy, which is the whole point. Now when you're using this type of setting, you can just see how like slowly it goes down, right? And the cool part is when you're drilling fast, right? Man, you're going in, you're like, poof, right? It goes down, it goes down so fast. You're like, oh my gosh. Like, then you take the burr out and you're like, hey, I hope I had my correct angulation side to side and mesiodistally and buccolingually. So, but you can't always tell because you're just going so fast. You're not really even concentrated on the angulation. But when you're drilling slower right here, when you're going in, you can stop. You can see this go in. When you're going down, you can change your angulation slightly. So this is what, one reason why I do like drilling slower. Uh, so for my initial osteotomy, when I'm making my first initial hole punch, I'm gonna be using this higher speed just to uh, define my boundary. Um, at that second point, what we like doing is we'd like to drop the speed down to 50-50, and that's when the burr just kind of winds itself down. At that point, you can be extremely accurate in terms of your mesial distal and buccal lingual directions, so you're not having to worry about uh, changing your angulation so much later down the road. When my third setting, I recommend placing an implant at 30, uh, RPMs and 30 Newton centimeters. So just slow, it's, it's way slower, it's just like a tiny watch winding downwards. We do recommend placing implants with the handpiece over a torque wrench, because you have way more control over the angulation putting something in with the handpiece than you do trying to manipulate a torque wrench. Uh, by the time you get the implant in down all the way, your implant may be tilted over here or over here even because you just can't always see it as well. Also for the speed, I'd like 30 Newton centimeters because if you're putting an implant in and the implant keeps going down and you reach the crustal portion of the bone and the implant keeps going down, you know that's not a stable implant. Uh, what your goal should be is when you're putting an implant in here, I'm just gonna pop this tissue off, and you want when you want the implant to be even, right? If you're putting an implant in, you never want the implant to be, even with the crustal bone, you want it to be one millimeter below. And when you're, I'd say a good rule of thumb is if you're going at this speed and you're putting an implant in and it stops about two millimeters above the bone, for every millimeter that you go in deeper, it usually corresponds to 10 Newton centimeters. So you know if you're putting this implant in and it stops two millimeters above the bone, you're like, boom, perfect, right? Like I know this implant's gonna be very secure. But if it keeps going down and you're getting even with the bone and it still hasn't stopped itself from going in, at that point, that's when you may want to think about taking the implant out um, and putting a longer or wider implant in. Or at that point, you're going to have to do primary closure and let the implant heal because the stability is just not high enough. So 30, that's why I always put it on 30 for 
my uh, insertion for the implant. So let's go through a full drilling sequence We're using the Neodent surgical kit. The, for this video, we're going to be using this model here. This is the one that I was previously showing where to put your incision. And again, the incision is going to be um, lingualized, I'd say about two thirds of the way through, not mid crustal. Uh, mid crustal will be over here, right there. We're going to do ours lingualized. And for the sake of the video, me just not messing around with this tissue, we're going to pop it off. And it's not that easy in the patient's mouth. <laughs> so just kind of get rid of that stuff there. And remember, too, for this video, I'm going to use the drill stop kit. Uh, I still think it's very, very nice to not having to worry so much about the depth of your drilling when you're worried also about the angulation. So if you could take one of the steps out of it, which is not being so concerned about the depth, then you can focus more on the angulation of what you're doing. So burr-wise, one of my most important burrs is this one. This is my 1.5 millimeter lance burr. I use this one in every single case that I do. I've used this same burr now for six years, um, and I just can't stop using it because of how small it is and how uh, detailed I can be with my initial osteotomy. So if you weren't using this burr and you're just using something from a kit, and, or really for any kit that there is, you're gonna be using something like a lance burr that's two millimeters, but look how much wider that this lance is than the other one here. So this 1.5 millimeter one versus this two millimeter lance. You're just way, you're easier to, your way, you can change your angulation way better. So the first things that you're doing when you're starting an osteotomy, right? And for me, the patient would be about this direction here, right there. So you're gonna be looking down and even in the beginning, I actually like to mark bone with a pencil. And uh, if your patient asks, tell them it's a dental pencil. It's not a you know golf pencil or number two pencil. Uh, tell them it's a dental pencil. So I'll actually like to mark up the bone. I think it, it makes it very, very uh, easy to see things what you're doing. You could even mark a line in terms of where the middle of the bone is. And then like where like the middle of the ridge is in the middle of these two parts. Right? And your implant's gonna be right in the middle. And also too, when you're looking at osteotomy, you have bone that you can see almost like a little cortex on the front, that's cortex bone here, and then cortex bone on here where the lingual is. You want to start right in the middle, but you wanna start a little bit more lingualized right here. Middle of the ridge is like right here. Your entrance wants to be just lingual to it. And the reason is each time you increase the width of your burr, if you start more lingual, every time you increase the size of your burr, your burr is gonna go towards the path of least resistance. So it's gonna go not in the direction of cortical bone. Cortical bone is gonna be on the lingual. It's gonna go towards the uh, softer bone in the middle, right? So every time you increase the size and width of your burr, your burr is going to go towards the buckle. And by the time you end up placing your implant, your implant will be in the middle of the ridge rather than too close to the buckle. So what we commonly see, we commonly see as an error is a lot of people will start their osteotomy right here in the middle or a little bit more buckle. And if you start drilling in the middle or a little bit more to the facial buckle area, every burr that you do is gonna go out towards the buckle more. And now your buckle bone will be one millimeter thick. And that is how we end up with bone loss in the beginning. So remember, there has to be a full circle. That full circle needs to have one and a half millimeters of bone circumferentially around it to prevent any bone loss for the implant. So always remember, start lingualize with your osteotomy and your burrs follow the path of least resistance. So I drill these ones high speed, it's high speed, usually 2000 and tons of water. Obviously this is a model, so I'm not gonna put water on it. So I always, the first thing you do is you just go in and you're just defining your osteotomy, right? And you have like a little hole there. So I like to just create a little hole first, and then you can look at exactly where that little hole is. 
So if you, at this point in time, you can change anything you want about the astatomy because you, you only created a small hole. You can make this a little bit more facial. If you don't like it between the teeth, you can redefine where you are because you're starting with such a small burr already. So you can change the angulation, great, or change the spot that you're doing. So first is getting detailed exactly where you want the tip of the implant to be. So for this one, I was happy where, where it is. If not, well, let's say you are a little bit too more too buckle. All you do is you put your burr in here and you just drag it this direction. And we're really only going in two millimeters at most. So you're just defining the most coronal portion of your osteotomy. So if you have to go more lingual, you just bring in a little bit more lingual like that. Just dragging it in over, that's all. Bone is super pliable, flexible. You can change what you're doing with it. So now my osteotomy is right there in the middle. And if you like where you're going, and if you like where you're going mesial distally, and you kind of look at the top, and you like where you're going in terms of this direction, and this direction I want to bring it right here, right to the middle of the osteotomy, and this is the middle too, that's when I would drop the burr down about a few millimeters. I usually go about five to six millimeters at that point we're going to take an x-ray and when we take an x-ray I'll use this burr inside of it and remember Asya is only at a millimeter and a half right now so we have a ton of flexibility to change angulation so we'll put this one back in and you kind of look at it we're going to evaluate where we want things to be so this one I'd say we're right smack dab in the middle of where we want to be there I could argue you want to go maybe half a millimeter to the mesial a little bit when you're looking down on the burr right here, it's coming out pretty much in the center of where the occlusion is. So if you take the x-ray and you like where you are, great. If not, then what I like to do is I like to change it with this burr because the osteotomy at this point is still so small. So let's say you are, let's say you're like this with it and you're like, oh crap, like I'm right headed right towards the root tip of this. The first thing you're going to want to do is See so how it's angled here, is you're gonna to wanna to put your burr back in, right here. And your first step is going to be standing the burr up. So stand the burr up in terms of the direction, like that. And then after you change, stand the burr up, you can go another millimeter deeper, just to redefine the osteotomy. And then now you've changed the angulation. And then you can do the same thing, take your burr out, put it back in this osteotomy, take another x-ray, and if you like it at that point, then we can start changing burrs. So at that point, I'll be done with my one and a half millimeter, and you pick up this one, you're like, man, that's way bigger. So at that point, that's why I love using that smaller one. More flexibility to change where you are. Then at this burr, this is your lance or pilot burr. This is the one you're going to take to your actual depth, depth of placement. And for this sake, we're gonna do an 11 and a half, so uh, what I'll do is I kind of go back in there, look where you are, and then go back over to the other adjacent roots. And you say, hey, where is this one? This root is the direction. Long axis is here. But the long axis of this one is here, right? So you need to be going in the middle. So you kind of go back and forth a couple times. Like this one's here. This one's here. So I want to be in the middle like that. So right in the middle of the two long axes. So right there. At this point, what I'd recommend is if you're doing 11 and a half, I would drill probably down to like a 10 or so, and then maybe take one more x-ray. And with these burrs, we have, we have eight, we have six, eight, 10, and then the bottom of the silver is 11.5. The top of the silver is 13, right there. So at that point, that's when you can take this lance out and put this one in back in. And you can look at the mesial distal direction, buccal lingual direction, and just make sure you like where you're coming out. And this one, I'd argue, go a little bit more of standing the burr up. So I'd rather stand the burr up a little bit right there. And that's where I like that perfectly there. And you took an x-ray, see so if you took the x-ray and you like that, 
that's when you need to make sure now you're going to the depth. And for this one, I want 11 and a half. So we're going to go pumping motion up and down. High speed, lots of water. And now we're down to the depth. And this one you can see it's at 11 and a half right there. Uh, one thing to keep in mind when you're doing your depth of drilling, if you look in an x-ray and you have depth that's um, even deeper that you, you know, let's say you have bone, you can go a little bit deeper. I would go towards probably the 13 because the goal is to place the implant one, one millimeter to two millimeters below the bone. So if the bone is there, that's when you would just drill a little bit further um, to make sure you don't run into a stopping point when you place the implant. Um, also too, but if you're, you know, let's say in your posterior maxilla here, I'd say my typical implant size is going to be a five by eight or a five by 10. And you're not going to want to drill or pick an implant that's the largest depth ever. So let's say you have the option to go up to 11 and a half millimeters on something, you're going to want to place an eight millimeter implant. Uh, that way you have a little bit of extra room. So if you have an implant fail or an implant that's spinning and you need to put a longer implant in that you can upsize the implant. So you never want to go the largest implant size that you can go. You want to go a little bit on the smaller size, leaving room for air, and that way you can upsize the implant later on, later on. So that one's done with my lance. And I do want to show this Lindemann burr. Now with the Lindemann burr, let's say you reach this two millimeter spot and your implant is at depth and you're really unhappy with the angulation. At that point, you're gonna put this burr back in right here. You're gonna, let's say we are like way tilted here and the implant is going towards the root, root tip of this tooth number 12, so you're like this, right? So you wanna put the, the burr back in. At that point, you're going to stand the burr up. We're going to high speed again. You're gonna stand the burr up right here. And then at that point, you're gonna have a bigger osteotomy here. So you're gonna have a little bit of a ledge because you're gonna have a hole here and you're gonna have a hole here. So now you have to make one defined hole so that way you're not slipping back into the other one. So at that point, what I recommend doing is now you put the burr back in and you basically have like a two different steps. You have like a step of, of bone imperfection on the inside here and one here. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna define the bone uh, profile here. So what I like to do is kind of go back and forth and you're just hugging this wall, this wall right here, and you're just smoothing that wall out. So now there's no bump in it. It's just straight up and down and you can't accidentally go back into the other hole. And for this one, next burr is going to be a 3.5. This one, because the model is kind of small, we're just going to be placing a 3.5.11 for it. Obviously, in the real mouth, we're not going to place 3.5.11. We're going to place like a 5.8. So looking right down on it, you can see it's right down in the middle here. You have plenty. You have a little bit of bone on the lingual. You have a ton of bone on the buckle, just how we like it. And so now 3.5 goes in. Now at this point... Uh, when we're upsizing to the 3.5, this is when I actually like to drop my speed down because when you're doing it, you can see your angulation, which is the most important part. And these just, it just winds down. And say while you're winding it down, you're like, hey, I kind of want to change the angulation. So you change your angulation a little bit while you're winding it down. That's why I like drilling at the slow speed. Or you can look at the top of the burr and you say, hey, I want to bring it a little bit more facial to be at the center of the occlusion. And you change it there. And then you go back to the front. And then you drill a slow still, go in this direction, still in the pump in motion. And what's cool is, this is really like a good tip. When you drill slow, the bone stays on the drill itself. Now, when you're looking at the drill and the bone that's in it, you're going to see that it's different colors. If it's white, and honestly, it actually does look like this in, in the mouth when it's D1 bone. If you have white bone that comes out in the flutes of the burr, that means that this bone is D1. If you bring out the burr and there's nothing on it, there's just a little blood, basically, at that point, that's D4 bone. And when you have D2, D3 bone, 
this will come out, there'll be bone on it, but it will be bloody bone at that point. It won't be a white color. So that is a really, really good indication of uh, how dense the bone is and how much you need to prep the bone. So let's say it comes out white like that. At that point, after you drill with your first burr all the way to depth, right, which can be, you know, if you have the bone depth to do it, you're going to want to go a little bit deeper. So let's say you're placing on a 10, go 11 and a half, you're going 11 and a half, try to maybe go towards like a 12 or 13 depth with it if you have the running room. Then you can see that white chunks, that could all be D1 bone. And that you're going to see a lot in the posterior mandible. So now reach the bottom of it. And this is where your regular burr. At that point, you're going to want to grab your plus size burr, which is going to bring your osteotomy 0.3 millimeters wider. And you're going to want to run this burr down because this is for dense bone using your plus size. So this is down all the way. And you go down, make sure you, when you take it out like that, you're kind of letting all the bone come out or have your assistant wipe it. Or you can even save this bone in a, in a bowl and put it back later on if you want to. So there we go to depth. I like my angulation, mesodisly, buccolingually as well. And then at that point, you're, you're ready to place your implant. A couple of things that can happen when placing the, or when placing the implant. But first, we're going to put this one in, and we'll talk about that. So we always recommend placing the implant with the handpiece, so you can see it better. And for this one, that's why I'm going to turn my program up to my third setting, which is going to be 30 newton centimeters and 30 RPMs to put my implant on. Okay. So now putting the implant in, we just bring it up, always up, upwards direction, so you don't drop it in the placement's mouth. Then you kind of turn it to its side once you actually get to the osteotomy. Make sure the patient's opening nice and wide. Then at that point, you can start placing the implant in. This one will probably torque out really, really early because this is a model for the bone. It's not going to be very realistic. And which is good for model work anyway because we can show you what to do. So let's say that this implant stopped that high up. Like that's some good bone, right? So at that point, you're going to want to take the implant back out. And sometimes when you're taking the implant out, it may not come out, want to come out because it's, it's a little bit past that 30 Newton centimeters. So what you could do is you could up the torque to 40 and that would budget enough to let it take out. And when you're taking the implant out and it's almost out all the way right here, that's when you tilt it like this just to make sure it stays on the carrier itself. And then you take the implant, put it back inside uh, this holder right here. And what I like to do at that point is I fill this jar with saline so you keep the implant hydrated. So in this case, since the implant stopped pretty much like four millimeters above the bone, that's when I would grab the next burr up and I would bring this one all the way to depth because it's just so much force. So you don't want to be cranking and implanting at that much force. Cool. So that was a 3.5. Now it's a 3.75. Let's put the implant back in. And same thing here, you can see it kind of just stops again because there's so much, there's so much force on it. Let me reverse this. And again, 
this doesn't happen much in the mouth because this is just a model, so the bone's way harder, right? And don't be afraid to take the implant out. Uh, a lot of the time in the beginning, we get okay with leaving the implant at the crest of the bone or um, instead of below the crest of the bone, which is not a good thing. So that's way better. We're at 30, or let's see, if we're at 30 and we can get this thing to stop a couple millimeters above the bone, that's way better. So at that point, you take your torque wrench, and we're gonna start putting it in. With the torque wrench, I like to have a finger on the top here, and then I like to hold the rest of my, my uh, torque wrench with these two fingers, because that's the way this one is helping protect it and pushing in the bone, because remember, implants are self-torquing. It has an active apex, so it's meant to be wound into the bone. So I like to put my finger on top of it here, and you kind of go in this direction. And one common mistake we see is a lot of time when we're putting implant in, we'll do like little turns like this. Like you want to do big turns, like a big turn this way. And let's say stability is very high. We're not going to go into this yet in this video, but a lot of time when you the stability is very high, you're going to just unwind it one or two, two back. Then you're going to go three forward one two three and then if it's still very stable you're going to go back two one two and then forward three one two three the reason you're doing that is uh, with knee dent implants and a lot of other implants they can be very stable because it is a conical connection you can actually cause a cold weld from the implant driver to the top of the implant. Uh, so you can actually cause this piece to actually get stuck inside of it. Uh, that doesn't really happen very often, right? But it still is a concern. Uh, so make sure you're not really putting a little bit too much muscle in it. And now these lines uh, right on these burrs, these correspond to one, two, and three in terms of the depth. So for the most part, you're going to want to put the implant in until it's uh, even with the first line, minimally. Okay, cool. So implant is in now. And even just looking at the model one here too, in looking down on it, let's say we're evaluating how how deep we want to go as far as the implant placement. What we do next is, let me put the tissue back on. What, what I like to do is measure the tissue thickness. So you look at this one, and I'd say that tissue is almost three millimeters wide. So, in, in the curriculum, make sure you're walking through the curriculum or uh, also reading the book Zero Bone Loss Concepts. And it talks about placing implants based on like biological width. So, if you want the biological width to basically be four. So, let's say you have three millimeters of tissue thickness, that means you want to place the implant one millimeter below the bone. Uh, if you have two millimeters of tissue thickness, that means you want to place the implant uh, two millimeters below the bone because. Uh, you're going to add way more tissue thickness, uh, which will allow a lot more blood supply, and you're going to prevent any bone loss around the top of your implant. For this specific case, and a lot of them in the beginning, um, don't, you can actually place cover screws if you'd like to. I do recommend in the beginning you can do kind of a sp even number between placing healing abutments and doing cover screws. We we. Uh, mostly because I want you to get the experience of re-entering the site surgically and 
surgically pressing the tissue buccally uh, and then placing the healing abutment once it's healed about 12 weeks later.